as I said here, to be on the light side today. Oh, I don't know. Excuse me, huh? I don't know. Tell you a story. We used to have a lab. That's good. But we had a, we had a lab that used to have like 42 machines in it. And it was super hot. It was no air conditioning. When I was a student and I had to work in this lab, I had, had all the classes in there. I, had to, I used to change the short term teachers. January, February, I had to change the short term teachers to go to the lab. Or else, one, I fell asleep. Uh, or two, I had to shower after. I was sweating. It was like 35, my joke at that time was 35 degrees in this lab. And, finally, and so every faculty meeting, every everything, every complaint to the department was going to the lab. There's the lab, it's too hot, too hot, too hot. Because he spent millions of dollars on the air conditioning system. And now the complaint is that it's so cold, it's so cold, it's so cold. And I keep telling students that don't complain because the alternative is way worse. Can I just sit in the class and go for cartography? Well, someone's in the front 45 degrees. Like sweats just dripping down your face. It was horrible. The worst place I've ever been. You can always wear a sweater. Oh, yeah. You can't take off your sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you just came in and didn't get your test, come see me. Just if you didn't get your test, come see me. Okay, so the, the essay question was out of 25, or was out of 15. Uh, I dropped it down to 10 uh, while grading, because uh, it was in everybody's best interest to have it out of 10. Yeah? Does that make sense? So I still graded that out of 15. A big problem that some students have in it, people that got well, did well, I mean, I, I pushed them off to perfect. If you got a problem, have to take a look at it. Uh, the bigger issue was that people were coming across with 15 points. And it was, yeah. So it was easier to, what I did was, the average was quite low, and so I just dropped it down and made it out of 10. Of course, I gave you five marks, basically, is what would happen. Does that make sense? Okay. If there's a problem, take a look. You want to talk about it, always have to chat. Um, same drill as last time. Don't come see me for the first 24 hours. Okay? As I mentioned, I'll tell you again as to why I do this. I do this because it eliminates some of the initial shock if you don't like your grade. Okay? So that when you do come to me, if there's an actual problem which I'm happy to deal with, you're coming to me because there's actually a problem. Fair enough? Yeah? Same deal. I get the first two pages. You got the next two pages. Uh, like I as mentioned, there's multiple reasons. One, I don't want you to have my test. Uh, two um, is that, uh, I'll give you an example. I put someone great, someone's grade incorrectly on the first test. Yeah? I was able to go back to my files, grab your test, and realize where I made a mistake. Yeah? If I didn't have it, it would have been very difficult for me to find it. And somebody would have got a grade that had no grade, and a person would have got a grade, or would have got no grade when they should have had a grade. Because of a typo. Make sense? If I don't have those things, I can never go back and double check and verify if there's ever an issue. Then it becomes he said, she said. And if I gave a grade to someone who didn't do something, is that person ever going to come to me and tell me that they didn't do it? And that, that their grade should be zero. Of course not. Right? Does that make sense? It becomes somewhat problematic. I, I prefer to keep them. I keep them for a year and then I throw them. Okay? Again, don't come see me for 24 hours. After 24 hours, if there's a problem and you want to discuss it, you're more than welcome to come and chat with me. I require an explanation as to what the regrade is for, um, and that just eliminates people saying, just can you regrade it? Yeah? Just have your reason, right? So I've had it, it's happened a couple times. Someone sent me in a paper with no explanation for regrade. I've asked for an explanation and have received none. Um, at which point, I'm not going to go regrade something when you can't even tell me why it's wrong. Make sense? I, I get it. I know it's a, it's a number scene for you guys to get to grad school, to get your programs and all that kind of stuff, but I, it's just, there's a lot of, I mean, I have 140 students and two, uh, more than that, about 150, in two condensed format courses over six weeks, and everybody asked me to regrade their assignments, it would be like 50 nuts, yeah? And so it has to come through for a reason. The memory grade can go down, it can stay the same, or it can go up by grade to zero. Like I, I don't, I don't look at the 
past grade uh, when grading. Um, so it can go in either in either direction for you. Just keep that in mind as well. Okay. Any questions for me? Uh, this is our second last class. Get set. Um, what we've done, exams on the 23rd. Got the date right, didn't I? So on the 23rd, and it's at one, nine. One. See? Is it 9 in the morning? I'm not going to spend time. It's in my calendar, don't worry, I'll show up. Is it a three or two? It's two hours. Um, I have both ones on the 21st, ones on the 23rd, ones at 9 in the morning, and ones in the afternoon. Um, they're both in the same room. IV, one, ten, twenty. I'll be in there for um, I'll, uh, I'll send, what I'll do is I'll send an email just confirming the date that you guys have one extra conversation. Okay. Any, any housekeeping things, any questions? So the paper, we're going to try super hard to get this thing back to you as soon as humanly possible. Yeah? And we've been pretty good with our turnaround time. Any complaints on the turnaround? No? Uh, we've got crappy weekends to get them back to you. Uh, I grade some. I TA grades some. So uh, there is a bit of, uh, okay. So it's pretty hard to get them back to you in, in enough time so that you can make decisions and have informed, make informed decisions. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the final paper. Fingers crossed. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that before your exam, before the 23rd, you've got those things graded with feedback um, for you guys to take a look at. So I'm, I'm, our goal, because uh, if we can push it back a couple of days, uh, my goal is the 21st. Yeah, so that's our goal. We're going to get the paper back to you the 21st. Uh, if it happens sooner, awesome. If it doesn't, I apologize. Uh, but if I give you the extension, uh, we might, by that week, by default, we sort of, you know, hang up ourselves and be able to get this back to you uh, before the end of the class. Uh, you have enough, I, the drop deadline that we just passed now. Yeah. You had something available regardless to make that decision. Um, you shouldn't wait to get a paper grade to decide how much you're going to study. Your final, I just want to make this clear, your final exam is 40% of your final grade. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how well you did going, going in. You can mess it up pretty bad to get 40% of your final exam. Okay. okay, so I never understood that. I understand the reason why you want to know what you're going in with. It has maybe, you know, reassurance in terms of where you stand, but you shouldn't change the way that you study. You should study. Uh, take a look at past exams. I encourage it if you have an option to look, to look at them through the registrar, um, because it gives you an idea of format. I'll tell you what the format is on one day anyway, so it's not going to help you that much, and they're not the same questions. So it can help from a format perspective, but the questions are just duplicated. It's the way they're asked. Fair enough? Okay, and it is cumulative. Okay, any, any questions? No? You guys are missing? No? Um, we're going to get into our electric dates and get the agro food industry. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to pick up the uh, multiple choice real quick. Okay, just, uh, just to bring and go through what the letters should be. Here's the correct. Come and see me. Again, you're more than welcome to come see the other part of your test at any time. Just let me know that it's fine. Um, I'll pick up here.
Okay. Um, number one. A. A. E. C. B. D. E. A. D. C. Again. A. A. E. C. B. D. E. A. D. C. These are the only things you should be coming to me today with if there's an error in the letter. Okay? And now you were giving one off that should have been correct. Okay, that's the only thing you should be coming to me today with. Besides that, uh, 24 hours. Okay? Again, my office is open if you want to see the test and see exactly what the question was and the corresponding to that. I go through it like I did last time. The problem is, is we are about to time constraint on one class left, and I gotta make sure I cover what I put on the exam. Our exams were due two weeks ago. <coughs> yeah? So I need to cover that material, um, or else it's gonna be bad for you. Right? So we gotta make sure that we get to do that or I go through it. Again, you can come to my office anytime to take a look at your test. Okay? Yeah, next Monday you're gonna come, next Monday is fine. Come between 11 um, and uh, and basically one the time the class starts. Uh, you can take a look if you have a seat in it as long as you like. Okay. We're going to watch a little bit of documentary today, for sure. Because it may or may not be on the test. So we'll be watching a little piece of what is called the coffee go round. I'm still sick, and I get like swallowing issues, my throat hurts. And I'm all congested, so if I stop and I'm like making weird sounds, that's why I'm apologizing again. You've been better though. <coughs> Hopefully by the end of the summer, I'll be um, I'm talking about something I wanted to say something I forgot. I'm talking about now. No, before that, before I get up to the I'll get done. Okay. If it comes to me, I'll. Okay. Um, so again, we're talking about agro industry today, so food. Um, it is an extractive industry in the sense that you are extracting a natural resource. Agriculture is renewable in theory in the sense that you can continue to produce off the same parcel of the land for long periods of time, assuming you don't mess this up. You know, yes, uh, with water, like climate change plays a role in this obviously, with water shortage, uh, there is a problem. Um, I got family here familiarly currently and they can't water their garden. The city, if somebody sees them water their garden, uh, they'll actually get a ticket. They will get a ticket for using water. It hasn't rained or any precipitation, including snow, uh, for about four and a half to five months. Yeah? It's problematic. No grapes for wine. Yeah, they can't make wine this year. They gotta buy their grapes from somewhere else because they're vineyards. So I would come from a quite rural area of my family. Um, so they, they tend to do a lot like make we make olive oil, uh, wine, uh, only white, we don't do red. Um, and yeah, I mean, not fully farmers, but uh, my grandpa was a, like, a farmer, but my family they, they still cultivate quite a fair bit and they consume um, they grow and have animals and all kinds of things. They, they still are very, very much attached to their land. Hasn't rained in five months. The only way that he's allowed to actually water is if he does not use municipal water, he uses groundwater and he pays for a well to be drilled in his property. That's the only way. If the city comes by and sees him watering his grass or his his garden, he will get a ticket. Yeah? It's crazy. Yeah. If he buys a water bottle, can he use that? I don't see it. Like, the, like, whoa, that would be crazy. You know how many water bottles you need? I'm just that Like, it would be like, 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 so I mean, like, tomatoes require a lot, of, like, a, a lot of water or else they're bitter. Cucumbers, a lot of water or else they're sour, that is the same thing. Um, or else, like, if you ever have a, have a very dry season and you have a cucumber from a dry season, it's like, it's bitter. Like, it, it doesn't taste good. Yeah? They're heavy in water, they have a lot of water content in them. Right, so they require water. Yeah, so if there's a rain, it's problematic. Um, so again, renewable theory, we can mess this up pretty bad. Uh, obviously, there's a, a, a big 
uh, a big aspect of sort of sustainable uh, practices when it comes to agriculture. We're not talking about individual farmers that are basically, it, it, we're talking about, I mean, the focus of what we're going to look at is obviously commercial agriculture. Now, more commercial, less uh, from you know, the local for your own self. I mean, I have a garden, which is a form of agriculture, but I'm not feeding people besides myself, and still not enough for me to live, right? Make sense? Um, so, you know, we focus on the, on, on the commercial side, and we'll look at some of these uneven geographies from the commercial side. Uh, we'll look at some places that are truly poor, and instead of them actually growing things that they can eat, they're stuck with cash crops that they can't eat uh, because of market value in terms of what it is. So you got places that are that are growing sugarcane when they should be growing lettuce. Yeah? Um, and some of these traps that they find themselves in um, in some of these markets where there is actual famine. Yeah? Some of these places are actual famine. Instead of growing things that can be consumed uh, that, high, have, that have high nutrition value, you know, they're growing things like ground nuts. Yeah? Does that make sense? So we'll look at some of these uneven geographies. Again, Renewal theory, we can mess it up. Water shortage, soil erosion, you know, a variety of different things. Early agriculture uh, was, in, like, was very, um, uh, you know, there was no use of machinery. It was uh, animate power, so like it was animal, human power to basically uh, cultivate, uh, to basically grow the plant, to do all of those things, okay? Uh, we moved sort of away from this and we've gone through this process of, 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 of innovation in this in this sort of area. And what we basically have is now a highly industrialized uh, process um, in some places. Um, and so you've got markets where uh, heavy machinery are replacing workers. Um, we used to be historically, majority of people were, were farmers. Um, now it only makes a little 2% of the workforce uh, globally. Yeah, the rest of us do not do this. Anybody have any intention to get to agriculture? Oh, really? Uh, um, like, you know, from what side? Um, more like, 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 from a community standpoint? Okay. Um, do you come from a rural area? I'm from Brampton, but recently moved to Orange Okay, so, so a bit different. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, the majority of us aren't. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty shocked that somebody even said yes. Well, no one here has any intention to get into agriculture. Um, uh, that might change with I think I talked about the last class, and the class bear with me. But, uh, you know, with cannabis, yeah, this might change. Yeah, with, with the legalization of, uh, of, uh, of marijuana, I don't think we're going to get the same sort of, sort of like crazy people getting into this thing, but I think there's going to be somewhat of a, a market for it, people that might be interested in an opportunity, you know, maybe an opportunity to get a, a contract with the government to basically supply these things. Like the supply. Um, uh, marijuana for sale in Canada. By 2018, we'll be able to go to a store, I don't know where, but a store to get this. Uh, Kushnard, which is uh, the owner of Max Mill and Daisy Mart uh, in uh, Circle K and you know, all these convenience store chains, um, actually wants to have pot sold from their location. So, what are some of the problems with social stuff? But um, I think you're going to see maybe a little bit of a jump. I'm not talking about like a jump where it's like three percent, but like you might see people, people's interests uh, might become heightened, right? Because there might be a, 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 you know, a time of opportunity. Um, right now, a lot of these illegal establishments are being funded uh, by illegal growing, right? That's kind of going in and being sold out, and so um, you're going to see a complete restructuring in terms of how we're currently happening for medical. There's only one real way to get medical marijuana, and that's through uh, mail. Yeah, you can legitimately get it from, but it has to be mailed to you. You can't actually go to one of these establishments where you Skype with a doctor or whatever they tell you, and you get pot from them. It's not legal. Um, there's a bit of a loophole, which is how they kind of work around it. Um, but yeah, so it's going to completely restructure that that, that, that that sort of area. Anyway, I find it super interesting from a retail perspective, from a retail geographer. Uh, in terms of where they're going to go, right? Uh, and how the distribution is going to actually happen. Anybody think that marijuana consumption is going to increase drastically? Who thinks it's not? If you smoke weed, you're going to keep smoking weed. Yeah? If you don't smoke weed, you're not going to start smoking it. Right? Like, you, I mean, you might die, you might, because it's legal. I think it's going to be next to impossible to get any, any black market marijuana, and that's good for schools. Yeah? 
because there's no longer a viable market for it. I think that's what you can end up having from a personal perspective. Again, it's just somewhat related but unrelated. Uh, but something that, like, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of your are you even learning about this stuff more and more, talking about your classes? No. Not really. I'm surprised. Um, I feel like it's something that you're, go you're going to be talking about more and more. I think we're trying to ignore it at, at the academic level, but I think eventually it's something that you need to talk about in terms of how it's going to be regulated, uh, distribution, age, policy, you know, all kinds of things that come out of it, which I find, I find fascinating. Right? Whether you do it or don't do it, it affects people, and everybody has a, a, you know, people have very strong opinions about this. Yeah, either in favor or against. Um, so it's one or the other in terms of where you stand. So I find it, find it kind of, kind of an interesting thing. And anyway, so you might see some, you know, people, younger people might might want to get into this. Again, you grew, you require a lot of land to be able to do this stuff anyway. But again, something to think about. Um, Agriculture existed as a certain way for a very, very long time. And, and this industrialized process is something that's quite young, it's new, it's not something that's old. Um, and so it has resulted in a variety of things basically happening. One is, 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 is the fact that uh, it's really created the haves and have nots. Uh, you have this polarization, it's very market specific, where you have farmers that can compete on the global marketplace and sell their products because um, they have capital to be able to do so. And some of that even comes in the form of subsidies uh, to be able to do it. And then you have farmers that cannot. And it's hard for them to keep up uh, because of this lack of industrialization that they've gone through. Um, we are in a point where we create this permanent global summertime. And what I'm referring to by this is, is the fact that you can buy uh, groceries. You can buy things that are out of season um, all of the time. Yeah? You can have watermelon at Christmas time. You can have, you know, you, you can eat things that are out of season because we're at the point that we're artificially creating, or we're, 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 we're sort of restructuring the way that growing seasons exist, yeah? Uh, shipping has become far easier, right? So this compression of space and time starts to happen, and things can travel farther, faster, for a lot cheaper, and that also offers some opportunities, yeah? It's a lot different than a lot of other industries in the sense that, or in terms of uh, other types of manufacturers, no process. It's fundamentally different because there's a kind of physical requirement that is etched into this, that's embedded into um, uh, this sort of industry. It's fundamentally a local process in the sense that it's bound by the biophysical. Right, so there's a biophysical element or, or requirement which is needed for you to grow certain types of vegetation. Okay? They will coffee. Yeah? Drinks coffee here. Anyone not a coffee drinker? That's probably easier to ask this. Anyone here not a coffee drinker? Yeah, there's a few. Um, we love coffee in North America. It's our go-to brew. Yeah, we enjoy uh, a nice cup of coffee. Uh, we consume it at a high volume, and we're going to look at some of this. Um, all of us have, anyone know any coffee snobs? Yeah, where it's like, it's just, it has to be a certain, like, they only make a certain type of coffee, you gotta buy the beans a certain place, Starbucks isn't good enough, the more isn't good enough, nothing's good enough, you gotta spend $17 on a cup of coffee, or something good. Um, we all know some of these individuals, I'm not not paying for anything here, be a coffee snob. Um, but there's a huge industry around this, right? There's a social element to coffee drinking, yeah? Why did you start drinking coffee? Who here had coffee for the first time and was like, this is delicious? I don't think so. Oh, one or two people? Yeah? Um, I had coffee, I, mean, I used to, to take double-double. You know why I used to make double-double? You don't taste the coffee, right? That's how I started drinking coffee. It was, let me do whatever I can to this thing so I could sit down at you know, 16 or 15 and hang out with my friends at a coffee shop, that's what you're supposed to do, and consume this, 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 this dark, coffee thing, drink, that tastes not that good for most people. And you kind of mask it. And then your palate changes as you, as you sort of age and start to appreciate the different flavors that come out of coffee, right? And, and it kind of changes to the point where, I don't know what you got, I think coffee black now. I'll double, double to have nothing in it because I want to taste it. And fundamentally different. There's a huge social element and things like that. Now, um, where do you get your coffee is extremely important. 
lots of coffee producers. There's tons of people that are getting on this market. It's actually argued to be the second largest traded commodity in the world. Yeah, next to oil. It's the other, it's the other black hole, right? Second largest trade commodity, it's been argued as a second largest trade commodity. People are getting into this from a variety of different places where the coffee bean can actually grow, places like Vietnam, yeah? Uh, where the biophysical element is there, but the history isn't there in terms of how they produce. That does something to supply and demand, to the price of coffee, making it very difficult for markets like Brazil, places like Colombia, where the coffee beans that come out of those markets uh, have not industrialized. Those places have not been able to industrialize because of where the coffee is sort of located. So it requires a lot of manpower. And so it needs the cost of coffee to be at a certain level for it to be economically viable. Yeah? I love coffee. I would love the opportunity to grow coffee in my backyard, but I can't do it. I could be artificially construct something, but the, 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 the quality of that coffee would be horrendous. Yeah? It would be horrible. Yeah? So there is this biophysical uh, element that sort of restricts what you get and how you get. Anybody drive through the Niagara region in the summer and go eat berries and boss? Like one of my favorite things to do with the kids is as you get into August and all those fruits and vegetables are ready in the Niagara region, there's all these little markets off the street. You can't bring it's not cheap. Um, but you drive through it and um, I love, um, I don't like perfect fruit. Yeah? Like there's something about sitting down with like, a half rotten apple and start cutting around the edges to get to the good part. And like, just there's something to it, I don't know, because usually I eat imperfect fruit because I have fruit trees in my backyard, nothing perfect when you have no fruit trees, because um, it can't be. Um, and so I think there's like the nostalgia play in it. When you go to these, like, these markets, it's just unbelievable. Now, they have the growing conditions to grow those things. Yeah? It is seasonal. The window that they have, right, to get those things, right? have them created, right, to, to have them ripen and, and, and to be ready for sale. But I can buy strawberries and berries 12 months after year. Yeah, from other places. Yeah? Uh, there's this microclimate, obviously, that's in the Niagara region, which allows you to, to grow wine or grapes um, and, and, and these types of fruits and vegetables, um, you know, curry that sort of kind of uh, People in Italy are eating tomatoes already. Anybody grow tomatoes? Yeah? I'm not going to eat my first tomato until August. It's not going to happen. My trees are kind of big, but there's nothing, there's nothing on them. Yeah, little, little things. In, in Italy right now, they're eating their first tomatoes off their plants. A big part of that has to do with the fact that it gets warm by like February. Things start to heat up. Yeah, it's just completely different, right? Um, so yeah, hugely biophysical. There's also a social cultural condition to it, right? So there's a, uh, how society views um, uh, those types of goods, what they want to produce, how they produce it, and where they sell it. Uh, obviously, global, global distribution and consumption. There's an increased availability of high value foods. Um, and so, when we talk about high value foods, we're talking about um, things that are consumed usually on a small volume, uh, but have a, 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 quite a large price associated with them. So, these are things like papaya. Uh, these are things like dragon fruit. Um, you know, uh, the value associated with the cost of those things is quite high. Uh, Atkins, these things are heavily polarized. In the sense that not everybody can consume these things or eat these things. Um, I don't know if, you know, there's a lot of things that I, 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 I like, um, but I'm mindful of price at the time that I'm at the grocery store. So if things are out of season, the price of those items are, are, are obviously a lot higher um, to, to actually purchase them. Which adds, adds some complexity in terms of how we shop. So, again, there's full, from a macro level, a market difference in terms of polarization. Uh, we're going to consume things in North America that maybe some other lesser developed countries are going to have less access to. So from that perspective, but we can even look at this at a local level uh, within actual cities. So these are you know things like the difference between a no frills and a Whole Foods. Yeah, it's a fundamental difference in terms of the quality or type of products you get. So you saw this in the papaya, right? When Mina was talking about her mother and how her mother would be so upset if, if she bought perfect fruit at that price because it's okay if it's not perfect. It's still good, and you don't have to spend that kind of money to actually purchase it. And so you've got this kind of fundamental difference where you have this, you know, this immigrant who is not going to the premium grocery store to make that purchase, uh, but her daughter works at this premium grocery store where she's trying to source this, these papayas to teach people how to eat them and basically sell this high value food item in those markets. Yeah? So again, but yes, we probably consume in North America more than some other places, but on the flip side, 
uh, depending on where you live in the city, uh, what that price point, what, what the price point might be, uh, you're going to have access to different types of things. Uh, if you look at places like Detroit, so the U.S. do they partake in high high value food? Sure, but if you live in, in, in downtown Detroit, there's no grocery store in downtown Detroit. Right? Not going to change availability, access for sure. Yeah. Um, so again, there are some differences. Yeah. I work at Costco. Usually, we get fruits and stuff in season, like peaches in the summer. On the area, like on the area, yeah. And we got a few months ago, we had these cotton candy fruits that came in. And I was like, are these even real? They were tiny, tiny packages. Oh, they're so good. Everybody was going nuts for them. Those are so good. So, what I don't know what this is. It's just like a white, pink, green. Like, it's not a red one, it's not like a green one, it's just like in the middle. It's like in the case of candy? Is this kind of like, like, it's like you were like some, like, I don't know if you grew up like in Roman times and you were lying on things that was speaking great with these yeah, bigger grapes you're being then. Yeah, everyone's going nuts because of color and like I've seen it before. Oh, that's cool. Do you know where it came from? Yeah. Can you fly it? Yeah. Feel like yeah. that? Maybe you might be able to ask somebody there if they know where it came from. Usually there'll be some stamp on the box. Mm -hmm. If you can find out, let me know. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, we see this all the time um, in terms of like you know, new crazy thing, but again, there's going to be a difference in terms of who, who those clients are, who those customers are. Look at Costco, the price point for Costco, uh, it's cheaper, okay, like in the sense for quantity, not all things on some things, you have to obviously be, you have to be smart. Which, which one do you, do you work in, in Sauber, Toronto? Yeah, the one on the, um, Park Dixie, uh, Lair Road in Chicago. So, um, depending on where the market is, you're going to have different, but one of the big things about Costco is the actual cost, yeah, the cost of membership, and then the cost of the volume. It's hard to go to Costco and not spend 300 bucks. So you might be saving longer, but it's nice to like it, it is a feat to go in there and try to spend less than 300 dollars. Yes, you find you know in bulk, and you're not going to go there every single week. It's not a normal grocery store. Um, but does that automatically take somebody off the market in terms of who can actually shop at Costco? For sure. Yeah, I got to run 100 bucks per membership, and that gets me nothing. It gives me the right to shop there. Then I got to go there, and if I just I look and say, well, this seems a hundred, but I hear you talking about razors, right? I went buy razors there. The pack of my razors, $80. Yeah? I could buy my razors at Shoppers, Go Frills, wherever it is, right? But the razors are uh, uh, for uh, a lot less, right? So I think it's like $89 for my pack of razors. How much is that? It's, there's, there's a lot of them in it. Yeah, I don't know what the number is. Um, so Gillette Fusion is like a bunch of them in this freaking thing. And they're all whatever. I can go and I can buy a smaller packet at, at any other retailer and spend, oh, you know, 25, 30 bucks. Now, smaller quantity. If you don't have the money to go and I spend 80 bucks on razors when you do, I mean, think about that. 80, I just spent 80. Now, I don't have to go and buy it all the time. Those razors are going to last me about six, seven months, right? Fine. Yeah, not, not a problem. But, yeah. Does everybody have that kind of money liquid at that time to make that purchase. So what kind of profile of shopper are you getting at Costco? You start to get into thinking, right? Like in terms of, you know, you're already dealing with this, this middle to upper by the time that you get there, right? You're not gonna get, you know, everybody being able to take advantage of that. Sometimes the populations that should be taking advantage of that bulk are ones that are being, you know, sort of left out because the, the fact that it's bulk is, what is a part of that problem. Yeah? Make sense? Like I barbecue a lot in the summer, right? So I like to have a lot of ketchup on hand. For me to go and buy three packs of ketchup, three bottles of ketchup, not a huge deal. By the time the summer's done, yeah, like I mean, it's gone, yeah? Sure, but it's my, isn't it cheaper if I want to buy one unit as a whole? Not by volume, but total cost. Okay, so you gotta think about these things. Anyway, very, 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 very polarized access uh, to these types of things. Yeah, so think about the difference between Rosedale and Parkdale, yeah? Or Rosedale and Rexdale, right? There's a fundamental difference in terms of what you have access to. Um, traditional products tend to have very simplistic value chains, so think about grain, wheat, stuff like that. Uh, you have the food production, the processing of it, the market distribution, and ultimately the consumption that takes place. Um, as things become uh, increasingly more complex, this chain becomes more complex in terms of you know how things are created, where they go, uh, how those products basically are funneled through that system, and so on and so forth. We're going to look at an example between uh, 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 chicken and, and, and a more traditional form of, of uh, less high value source product. Uh, chicken can be put into multiple different end uses, and so the production process becomes quite complex 
uh, when, you, when you watch that bird go through that chain, uh, some of it obviously for human consumption, other of it for feed and a variety of different sources, right? So, you know, if you got pets, you don't eat, right? You buy your pet's food, it's chicken based or whatever, right? right? So the chicken is used for all kinds of, if you give an animal, you can feed your animals, it might be a chicken based food process, right? That you might want to give them not corn or maybe corn and not that or whatever. Okay, so it can be relatively complex. Um, where do you think technology, which segment is more likely to benefit from, from sort of innovation, technological innovation? Go ahead, Mr. Sure. Could it be in processing? Sure. Could it be in marketing and distribution? Sure. Could it be in consumption? Sure. Why? This is one, there's a transportation aspect between all of this. And there's a huge technological component in the actual processing of those foods. Yeah? That high, like you're adding value at each element of that production process, right? So I'll give you an example. Grain is worth one price, right? Grain is one thing. Process grain into flour, the value of flour is now higher than that of grain. Yeah? Flour used for bread, so if you have bread now, it's greater value, it's worth more than natural flour, just flour. Does that make sense? Yeah? So from the production side of things, as you add value, can you become more efficient in the transition of those goods into the end product? Sure. So there's technology within that, the transportation of those goods between those. How do we get those goods to individual people? If you think about consumers consuming, right? Think about the papaya again. Yeah? Moving into that consumption. Uh, sourcing from, from new places, things of that nature, right? So technology plays a role in these things. How about the state? What role does the state play? Where does the state like we have influence? Yeah. Sure. What else? All of them. Does the state control the way things are produced? Could it be regulations based on where that production is happening? Sure. How about in terms of how it's processed? You guys remember like the list, uh, list, um, the list of the Listeria? Listeria outbreak? At the uh, Maple Lodge, the Maple Leaf. Oh. You remember this? Yeah. And all the food was contaminated? Yeah? There's regulation on cleanliness, how it gets processed, all these types of things. One major issue in a lot of places where food's processed is rats. Yeah? Rats carry tons of diseases. Yeah? Tons of diseases. So how do you keep the rats out of that food source? Who regulates that? Where's that food coming from? They might even when you travel. Anyone ever try to bring meat from somewhere else? Just meat? I was like, when I go to Italy, it's just so good. I mean, they have all these cured meats and stuff like that. It's like, it's like, it's just amazing. So, like, I've tried multiple times. I found the easiest way for me to bring food over. I'm going to eat it right away. I'm not selling it. I understand what the regulations are, but I actually put them in sandwiches. And I put them in my carry-on <laughs> sandwich. Well, are you reporting me now? Wow, really? Right? Oh, yeah, that's my thing. It is, isn't it? Uh, cheese. Sometimes you can bring certain cheeses, other times you can't bring certain cheeses because of these, you know, some of these issues, right? So uh, there's restriction on what comes in. Uh, same thing with market distribution, there might be legalities in terms of how things are distributed, what they look like, packaging, things of that nature, um, like nutrition content packaging and stuff like that. It's going to be specific to place. Yeah? Think about I mean, that movie, uh, Super Size Me, messed things up for like these fast food chains. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, McDonald's could not offer super size sizes, which actually upset me because I just like the super size fries. <laughs> I don't know, I can't get them, I can only get large. And I wanted those extra like 20 fries. Didn't need them, but I wanted them. Um, then they started to have to put the actual calorie content on those things, right? Like, if you think about that, who controls that? Do you think they want to tell you how many calories a Big Mac is? No, they want you to eat it. And that's the end of it. Yeah? They don't want to tell you these things. They do it because there's going to be pressures. These things sort of start to happen. You know, you know what I mean? There's obviously pressure that come with these types of things. Anyway, so state's going to play a role in all of these. Okay. Uh, how about TNCs? Where do you like to see large TNCs? 
Would you imagine that you find a TNT that might operate in, in special aggro all aspects? Would you think that you would see vertically integrated uh, uh, transnational corporations that control entire food production process from the farm to the ultimate consumption of those goods? Would you imagine that you would see stuff like this? Sure, that's lucrative. You could find you know, that, that, that some of these huge major uh, companies um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll actually go out and buy farms. Yeah, they'll go out and buy farms. Like corn, think of corn as an example. Corn, ethanol, you know, in gas, 10% of your gas has to be, there's, there's a requirement in Canada for the amount of ethanol. Um, your gas can come up to 10% ethanol. Uh, it's done for really, a, it's a, it's a, ethanol is renewable. <laughs> now, who's interested in what was happening here? Funny. I kind of just want to like, knock on that door. They can't open it. They can't open it from that side either? What was the point of the door? Oh, he has to bolt it to the floor. I think there's drywall. I feel like doors are more expensive than drywall. Okay. What's up with this? Uh, Extracting it with people. Corn. Corn. Corn's removable. Yeah? And so ethanol is actually processed from corn. It can be removed from all, a lot of things. But corn is one of the major ones in the Midwest that is used uh, for ethanol. Um, so they process corn, those things, again, it's renewable, you put 10%, it actually reduces the amount of gas that's consumed. There's some problems with it, there's reasons why they do it. Uh, we're not going to get into ethanol in this class, but um, if I'm a, a gas company, would it be lucrative for me to look at purchasing, because it's highly subsidized? Yeah, corn is highly subsidized in the United States. Um, so they're actually able to sell corn at a higher, uh, at a lower cost than what it costs them to produce it, because the government gives them a crap load of money to do it. Yeah? Does that make sense? So would it be lucrative for a company, like maybe you know some major oil company or whatever, to go and actually buy a corn farm? Yes? Big time. Wait, I'm getting You mean, I buy this farm, the government's gonna give me money. I get up to 10% of the stuff in my gas anyway, which I would've had to buy regardless. And I can just own that, and they're gonna, they're gonna give me? All right, I'm going to, uh, I now you, genius, yeah? Control all aspects of that, of that process. In some cases, you're not going to see this, but in a lot of cases, you are. And so it's, like, it's not uncommon to see a lot of vertically integrated um, agro companies. And how about consumption? How about populations um, in terms of what they eat? Is that going to change? Yeah? How about status? Does status affect this? Talk about this a little bit. What are the two things that happen once you start to industrialize? What are the two things that happen? What do you buy as the country starts to develop? As the country, starts to develop, as the country develops, what are the two things that shoot up in terms of uh, as you have this growth in middle, in sort of a middle class? Um, what were the two things that people purchase? Both of them are leading contributors to climate change. Cars. Cars and? Nope. <laughs> what do they buy? Meat. We buy meat. We eat meat. Yeah? Remember that, you know, you ever heard that saying? Uh, this idea of Sunday roast, you know where that where this comes from, isn't that? I think I did. Sunday roast, the idea of Sunday roast, uh, literally people would eat meat once a week. Um, it, was, it was to show that you could eat meat once a week. Yeah? It was a sign of, of status. You could have a roast once a week. That was a, that was a big deal. Yeah? And so what happens is you have money, people start to consume more meat. Yeah? That's what you do. Now, um, you ever, it's just, you gotta think about places that are industrialized, you gotta think about some countries that are starting to develop, it's very removed from the developing to develop, and places like China. Uh, if you have that many people all of a sudden start to partake in these types of things, like one, buying vehicles, and second, consuming high volumes of, of actual meat, um, all of a sudden that starts to change sort of the, you know, it can pose some issues from a, a global perspective in terms of consumption practices. It's not me saying that they shouldn't be eaten driving cars. I'm just saying that it's something you need to consider, right? There's a large number of people 
uh, that are starting, you know, incomes in those markets are starting to rise. And with rising incomes, these are some of the things that take place. Um, yeah, but we, I, mean, I think I told you guys about the movie, right? The, the Bronx Tale with Robert De Niro. I tell you what, this about the guy eating. It's great, but anyone seen Bronx Tale? So there's a movie, it has, it's with Robert De Niro. Robert, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mafia movie, but Robert De Niro is actually not even a mafia in this movie. It's a bus driver, which is like weird, right? You always just imagine that it's in the mall, you know, all the movies. Um, he's actually, so he's not in the mall, he's, he's, uh, he's a bus driver. His son witnesses a murder. Um, witnesses a murder, and his son doesn't rat the guy out because in this Bronx neighborhood, you can't be a rat. Um, so he doesn't rat the guy out. Anyway, um, they're sitting down at the table, and they're going to eat their, they're, they're sitting down to have dinner, and the father's a like, the father's bus driver, Mark De Niro. His son, you know, they're sitting there, they're eating. His wife puts the steak, or his mom puts the steak down in front of him. He says, Ah, oh, Dad, I don't, want, I don't want steak. And then Robert De Niro's like, You guys gotta drive that bus up and down the street so you can eat steak once a week? And I thought it was a fascinating part of like the line, right? I mean, for most people, it's like, Ah, oh, whatever. They just drive a bus to buy steak. But I mean, that's a huge thing. It's a big thing for my father as well. I think I shared this with you as well, right? So, like, my father was very poor. He came from a very poor family. His father died when he was four. His mom was ill and never worked. Um, so he's extremely keen from very like humble beginning. It's actually kind of when I go and I, I see where he came, it's actually quite depressing. Um, he came from like nothing and never ate meat ever. He had actually nutrition issues into his 40s as a result of the of, a, of that food consumption, right? In terms of not eating properly when he was young. Um, and a big part of like my dad is, is to make sure that you eat like it's it, it's it's embedded in his mind. The second that he came here, he had like a, again, a factory job, there's like a bit of stability. Um, for him it was, he got to eat meat. Like that was like, it had this importance to him in terms of, because he didn't have it, his providing meat was expensive in body. Um, so again, I see this sort of happen. We got two examples here of production change. One quite simplistic um, in the sense of uh, fruits and vegetables in terms of how it sort of happens. Uh, contract farmers, large exporters, Canada, Zimbabwe, large UK importers, ultimately to the supermarket. And then you have chicken. Uh, it was a little bit more complex in the sense that chicken can be used for a variety of different types of uses. Um, and it's processed in different ways based on different cuts, where it's used, how it's used, um, and all those types of things. So it can be very simplistic or highly complex. Okay. Um, the more complex it becomes, uh, it's tends to be dominated by fewer people. So you have fewer companies that actually control that part. Um, as you look at producers that are more simplistic, there are a lot more, more producers that get into this sort of uh, uh, role, right? Uh, a big part of that has to do with the overhead for chicken production, like the production process is actually quite complex. Yeah? Or more complex. There's more type of technology required to do this than there would be for papaya or right? and other types of fruits and vegetables. Yeah? Um, there's also restrictions in terms of where this can happen. Yeah? You might not be able to actually purchase things from cross borders. There might be laws, restrictions. Remember the mad cows here? The U.S. used to buy a lot of cattle from Canada. Once that happened, there was like a huge border closure that took place. And that affected a lot of farmers that were, you know, that had cattle that were sold into the U.S. And all of a sudden, they can't do that anymore because there's basically laws against, they won't allow it, they wouldn't buy it anymore because of the scare, right? Um, so you see these as becomes a lot more complex with things like this. Okay. Here we're looking at coffee. Um, should we take a break? Who wants a break? Okay. We'll take a five minute break. Just go to the bathroom and talk about coffee. And just go. Give me time to set up.
Yes, you can. We can put up a little stand outside your farm and sell those eggs. Um, but, oh yeah, like, you have small farmers. Uh, they can't get into grocery stores. Like they can't, or they can't sell eggs. Um, like on, on like on the open market. But I could, if I had a farm and I want to put a little stand outside my farm and sell it over a farmer's market and sell eggs, I can't. Can I just build like a big burning house and sell it? Sure. Yeah. 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 Dairy is the same thing as dairy cold Yeah, that does the same thing in Canada. It's actually quite expensive to have these types of farms. So I'm not sure you so again, commercial, not Okay, let's start up again. Um, I think before I show the video, I want to get through some more content. We show this again. It's a lot more than all. Okay. If you look at coffee, I want to. I'm going to ask uh, a couple questions here. So how do you explain uh, for this pattern in terms of the location of the product? Huh? Climate. There's biophysical. Certain conditions that allow you to grow in certain places and not in others. Anybody know the difference between Arabica beans and Robusta beans? Anyone know what the difference is? Which ones are more expensive? Choices, it's not robust enough. Um, why are rabbit beans more expensive? You pay a premium at the grocery store if you were to buy those beans. But they tend to cost more. Anyone know why? Anyone know what the different growing conditions of robust are? So, robusta beans are grown uh, in lowlands, in humid tropics, uh, where it's a lot more common. Um, Bit easier to farm them, uh, the quality is said to be less. Arabica beans ha happen in high altitudes, okay? Uh, in places actually where it's very difficult to get machinery in to actually extract the coffee bean from, from, from the plants, okay? So it's, it's a lot of manual labor. Um, and so the bean, anyway, the beans are, are also said to be higher in quality. A lot of people are getting into the market nowadays are in the Arabica, are in the robusta side of things. Um, and it's actually effective with supplying the bag of coffee in terms of what the cost is. And it's posed some, some serious problems. Um, I don't think anybody here would actually ever want to be a, a, a coffee farmer. It's not the greatest thing to turn it into. Um, also, in place where rabbit is growing in Colombia, the cost of, of, of the actual bean has to be quite high for it to be lucrative. Another problem in places like that is the black market. Um, to keep farmers from going to other more lucrative industries, like in Colombia, let's say with cocaine, yeah, and cocaine plantations and stuff like that, they need to be paid relatively well, right? Or else they for other options. Um, and so you see um, a lot of this sort of happening in some of these markets, um, like in Colombia. Any questions? Okay, watch a video on this. Um, I'm going to. They'll go through some stuff and then we'll, we'll ultimately end off with the video. Otherwise, the whole thing. Yeah, it's 20 minutes. It's a really good video. I like it. I like it a lot. Just, it makes you want to drink coffee so bad. I bet you're like happy with the stuff. Grab coffee and have a few in here. Um, it's amazing. Just like, I can almost smell the coffee when I watch the video. Does that make sense? Anyway. Um, okay, I'm going to give you some quick numbers. There are four countries. Um, that generate about 66% of global coffee exports. Brazil accounts for about 32%. 94% of what comes out of Brazil is Arabica. Vietnam at 17% is 100% Robusta. Third is Colombia at 10%, all Arabica. And Indonesia at 7%, 87% of it is Robusta. So you get this idea of some of those spatial sort of distributions, differences, high altitudes. You're going to have, sorry? One more time. Yeah, no problem. You're not going to be passing on oh, anyway. Okay. But I just want to go on the numbers? No. That's no? Okay. That's not what I asked you. I asked you who the four who the four producers are. Yeah? Sorry, what? The third country I said was Colombia. Brazil, Colombia, Arabica, Indonesia, Vietnam, Robusta. 
that's the most important. Yeah. So I would never ask you for what percentage you come for. Okay. Here we're looking at the goals of production of chickens. What do you notice about chickens? They can be grown everywhere. Um, and so you're not you're not bound by the biophysical as much when it comes to chicken production. You see it. Um, you do get a sense of uh, the type of economy which is developed or developing or less developed uh, based on the amount. Places like Africa, you I mean, you pretty get a continent of Africa, and you, you start to see this limit the amount that, that actually exists there. A big part has to do with cost. Okay, so there is not even geography to it. The three largest chicken producing countries are the U.S., China, and Brazil. They account for about 50 percent of the world total. A big part of that has to do with the size of those economies, the size um, of those countries. Uh, this is looking at meat consumption. This is what I said before about increase with um, uh, with increases in with increases in in, um, in money the amount of money that's in the market. Okay, here we're looking at uh, fruits and vegetables. Okay. Oh yeah, so vegetables and, 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 and fruit uh, within these markets in terms of distribution. Again, um, you see from a, from a global production in terms of the amount, a lot of this stuff actually happens for local production. So stuff that happens in China is not being other places, not being sold to other places. What's actually grown in China is generally consumed in China. Same thing with Canada. Uh, even by, I mean, the U.S. is a little bit different. Uh, they do have two large um, manufacturing sort of parts of the uh, of the U.S. that actually ship fruits and vegetables to other places. One being California, and the other one being Florida. And obviously, Canada is a huge market for those. For those types of goods and services, okay? But again, the jar tends to be a little bit different. We're not looking at the types of fruits and vegetables. The types of fruits and vegetables are generally going to be different based on place from place to place, uh, but there are conditions to grow in a lot of these different markets. Um, places where you can't grow uh, tend not to be populated. Does that make sense? Yeah? A lot of initial settlements were attached to land, being able to grow things for consumption. We were largely for the majority of our lives, uh, we were nomads. Once we were no longer nomads, we kind of found places to settle. Where we decided to settle was largely based on what we could grow. Um, if you think about places like Canada, when people first came from Europe, they actually ignored places uh, like uh, um, like the prairies um, in the United States and in Canada uh, because they just the, the initial people that came in from Western Europe. I didn't have that type. They just thought that it would, we were not able to cultivate those types of lands. Once the next wave of immigration sort of happened uh, from places like Germany, they real they knew because they had it themselves uh, that that land was actually had largely fertile, and that's when we started to see development happening there and started moving those areas. But a lot of some of them had to do with to do with water, right? Availability of water, locating locating near water, and be very coastal. Um, and obviously, the ability to grow, they both have obviously their role in one right? Okay, uh, China again, 38%, majority from locally. India, India accounts for about 9% of fruits and vegetables. Again, a big part of it has to do with the size of the population and the future people. The US, 4.5%, and Brazil, 3.4%. Um, obviously, we have transformations that take place um, in terms of. Um, the way these things are done. Uh, the Industrial Revolution obviously affected agriculture. Uh, we saw a bunch of British enclosure laws take place. And this was basically the removal of common lands in England during the 18th century. Uh, they were basically common land for people to use for grain, for animal grazing, for all kinds of different things. Um, basically in the 18th century, they removed them um, and they made a private land ownership. Uh, they were no longer for common people right, to, to basically use. Uh, crop rotation start to happen. It's a way to more of a scale practice, not to grow the exact same thing at the exact same place every single year, but to rotate the crops. Right. To grow different things at different places. Um, land dispersion took place. Um, and so what that basically is, is that they took land that was not traditionally used for agricultural purposes and converted it to something that could be used for agricultural purposes. So you know, with a forest, they have a bunch of trees, and they start to convert land again um, into agricultural land. And then ultimately selective breeding. 
Um, so taking certain animals, certain species, certain breeds of, um, of, of human seeds for that matter, um, and starting to take the best sort of uh, 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 the best sort of product and start to breed it with the other ideal breeds uh, to, to, to create um, you know, a, a better seeds, uh, better animals, better you know, variety of things. Um, also with this came this global uh, cool chain. Um, and so all of a sudden, uh, things can travel farther, faster, for a lot cheaper. Cheaper um, Food is generally it's perishable, it can go bad. And so transportation plays a huge role. How quickly can I get that product to those places? Um, it improves quality. At what point do I need to pick that product? Is it going to ripen it on a truck or is it going to ripen it on a tree? And that's going to fundamentally change the quality um, of those individual things. Uh, again, the distances, you have a shrinking world, it becomes easier. Um, and also this idea of controlled atmospheres. So all of a sudden, you know, you have refrigeration or uh, you can artificially create uh, what you sort of need for those, you know, certain goods and services to basically grow. Or those, uh, those not services, but those goods, sorry. Okay. Um, you guys heard about the sort of the kinds of food miles? Yeah. Why, why are food miles, uh, what, what's the importance of food miles? What is a food mile? Anybody? Yeah, food miles. Yeah, so how long do we manage to or what was the distance that that food had to travel from? Uh, from where it was grown, where it was produced uh, to, to your plate. Uh, what, so what are some, what were some issues with this? And why is it important to understand food miles? Why is it important? Come on. Cost change with food miles? Who absorbs those costs? Consumers? How about sustainability? Yeah. Oil? It costs money to transport these things. It links to other types of extractive industries, uh, maybe to non, more non-renewable things, and it affects those things. Also, it has some effects on the local side. Yeah? There's always purchased locally, price points, things of that nature. Green Revolution. Uh, we have through this Green Revolution affected a variety of countries. I mean, the two big ones that got affected by the Green Revolution, largely affected by the Green Revolution, uh, were uh, Mexico, uh, India is another example uh, that went through this process of industrializing. Uh, there is not even geography to this revolution. This is not everybody has access to these things. Um, so what basically happened is you have hybrid, um, hybrid sort of seeds, uh, synthetic fertilizers. Uh, synthetic pesticides, basically protect you know what you have, uh, which could actually increase the output that you actually get from that production. Uh, water management, increased mechanization, in the sense of machinery to help you do um, those types of things. Anyway, um, there's a, a great deal of disparity between these new innovations. Not everybody has access to them, so there is a definite uneven sort of uh, geography to it. This is sort of a precursor to what ended up being. Uh, genetically modified organisms, okay? Um, who would eat that cow? You eat it? Or not No? No, no I, you saw it. Do you want to eat it? If I saw it, I'd be terrified. I'd be absolutely terrified. You do, but I think it's probably so much like artificial selection. So is it GMO? Well, for the first question, is that GMO? Is that genetically modified or is it artificial selection? Who thinks it's a GMO? I think you might have seen this. Who thinks it's a GMO for Canada? Who thinks it's artificial selection? It's actually artificial selection. Uh, what it is, is they, took, they breeded, uh, they, actually this was used for work purposes as opposed to uh, for consumption. Um, what it is, is they, they took a breed of, of a cow that basically had double the muscle mass, and they bred it with another cow that had the same genetic mutation. Um, they bred them together to create these 
Um, it never ended up working out because it had a variety of health issues that came along with having double the muscle mass. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty crazy day. I wish I had that problem. <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, that's our artificial slide. So, arguments for GMOs. What, so, what are GMOs, first of all? Genetically modified organisms. What are some benefits of GMOs? So you can create um, high, like resistant, pest resistant, um, uh, you know, genetically strong, we'll say, okay? Um, you know, products. Definitely. What else? What's the benefit? What's some other benefits? Yes? Diversity. Mm, does that actually happen? That's your lack of diversity. What else? Some benefits? Yes? Yeah. Way larger yields um, helps us deal with some food issues, food shortage issues, can help us deal with them. Um, uh, I think I talked to you guys about Malthusian theory right? a little bit. Mm -hmm. the guy, also in the other class, you got, you got a guy who said that we're going to basically all die because we're not going to have enough food. Um, obviously, they can count the fact that population growth was not going to happen as exponentially as you perceived, and you can obviously think about um, you know, industrialized process in the agro industry, which actually allows us to grow more from the same parts of the land that we're going to take out high, higher yields, so that for there to be a higher output uh, from the same amount of land that existed. Okay. He also thought that we were going to be very religious, right? We thought we were going to have babies, lots of them. He didn't believe in, obviously, using protection or people not. Okay, back in this time, granted, back in this time, by the time a child was four years old, yeah, they were an economic benefit. Four years old, economic benefit. Yeah. And now, I mean, you're lucky if you're not, by the time they get to, until they get to 24, that they're, you know what I mean? Like, it's a fundamentally different time in terms of, yeah. Anyway. What else? Oh, the negatives. So not hands, you should fly up. Yeah. And specifically with regards to society, the human genetic thing, like, this is you mean just pests? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, eventually, pests could evolve and become like a superfood. So you have, a, you have a monoculture. If the genetic makeup of all your stuff is the exact same, and you get a, one of these bugs, you can wipe out an entire. Um, since GMOs are relatively uh, new, we're not really sure what the long term effects of GMOs will be on the human body and even on the environment. So. Yeah, we have no idea what the is. Uh, all testing has been done on, on short-term intervals. Uh, we have no idea of long-term effects. I mean, we, we might, you know, this might be asbestos for all we know. And like, uh, um, that's great. But you know what I mean? We don't, we don't know what the effects are. Yeah, so we might be able to this is something that's saved our, you know, it's saved. We were able to feed a lot more people. All these kinds of things that are somewhat of a benefit. But what does it actually do to us? And we don't know. Okay. Uh, what else? Some other problems with GMOs. I get a company that tells you that it is not genetically modified, but a company that uses genetic modification does not even tell you that you're doing it. Yeah. They don't even know what you're putting in your body. Chances are if you're eating cereal, corn that you're eating, it's genetically modified. Yeah. It's kind of a money grab. Like, to, to label it GMO free, like, I, I assume it costs more money. It does. Them. I mean, I think there's a legality around it to say that GMO free, they need to be GMO free. The other really weird part about GMOs is that there's actually a patent on you on life. There's a patent on life. So, for example, farmers have had GMO seeds from like Monsanto's, so like, you've probably heard these Monsanto stories, uh, where like their crop is sort of blown over. Seeds are blown over from one crop to a neighboring crop, and it's sort of, because it's, you know, the, 
uh, resistant to a lot of things. They replace rock crops. Uh, they've actually covered or like uh, infiltrated other people's farms in the Monsanto and Austrian doors. They you know, get paid for that. That's my corn. That's my canola. Yeah, what do you mean it's my canola? Your canola is on my property. And they say, well, I can actually show you scientifically that the genetic makeup of that crop is mine. I own it. You can't sell that. If you sell it, you pay me for my seed. Yeah? So what happens to that crop that belongs to you? You just like, harvest it and get it to you? do. Or like, can I throw all my seeds into this lawn and then go take over this farm? Monsanto's been like, I don't know, there's some crazy documentaries on Monsanto. I don't show them because they're pretty biased. And I don't want to get into like what they are, but like they've been accused of being you know, like an organized crime syndicate. <laughs> Right? Like, they've been accused of, like, some fraud. I don't want to get into, like, I know that it's pretty sensitive issues for a lot of people. I don't want to get into, like, Monsanto as a whole. Uh, but they've been known to, I mean, they've been accused of a lot of real bad things. Like, it's real bad. Apparently, they, oh, that, like, for, there, there's actually, like, people that have done some, like, threatened to murder people. Like, it, it, like, there's documentaries of, like, Canadian farmers. There's one guy in Saskatchewan, canola farmer, uh, who went to battle with them, basically, no one got on their crop, they knocked on the door, and they said, hey, man, you got our canola. His wife, like, husband and wife, farmer, couple, older, um, were like, well, no, forget it. Who put it there? Who told you to put it there? You killed my crop with this thing, and now I got it from the cell. Who told you to put it there? Anyway, it went to, like, crazy lawsuit. Apparently, the guy's a buyer. Like, he says the guy's a buyer. He's done because he's actually threatened. He's threatened for his life from this, this company. And I was just like, this is it's crazy. And I, I, I want to make it clear to everybody here. I'm not saying that that story is true. Yeah? Sure. Yeah, I'm not saying it's true at all. Don't, don't like, Joe said that. That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm just saying there's been crazy accusations for Monsanto. Uh, there have been a lot of settlements out of court. They don't know how they got settled. Uh, there have been a lot of like suspicious things that have taken place. You can go on YouTube and you can find a bunch of stuff on Monsanto if you really want to. Um, I'm not saying any of this stuff. I'm just telling you what is out there in terms of what this company gets accused of. It's the same Monsanto that does many I have no idea if they do that or They do see the you know, Roundup. They do Roundup like the fertilizer. Okay. GMOs are banned in Europe. Uh, they don't get used in Europe, EU countries, so you see that they're not used in these markets. Canada, the US obviously use a lot for a variety of things. When you see the word maize, maize is corn. Corn is called maize in everywhere else in the world except for here, pretty much. Um, okay, so that's what corn is. Uh, that's what it's referred to. So in Canada, we got maize, soybean, canola, and sugar beet that are genetically modified that we grow. Um, in the US, there's maize, soybean, cotton, canola, sugar beet, alfalfa, uh, papaya, and squash. Um, also, if you notice, Africa doesn't use a lot of genetically modified stuff. And the big reason why that continent doesn't is because one of their largest buyers is Europe, and Europe has them banned. There's been places in, that have gone through crazy droughts and famines, and they've actually, like, government officials have actually refused to help the United States out of fear that their genetically modified organism, the crops that were being sent over, would be planted by the farmers, and then they would lose their contact or lose the ability of those contracts to sell their actual goods to Europe because they're banned in those markets. Yeah? Um, so there you go, right? Agro output per unit area of land, which is yield, is obviously increasing. Okay? Over, you know, modest increases in crop area. Size of farms, you see the number of farms decrease and the size of farms uh, basically increase. <coughs> what role does the state basically play in all this? Well, one big part of it is obviously regulation, so food regulation, uh, which becomes increasingly difficult with globalization, right? Because it's moving through places. Obviously, the EU and GMO is an example of that. Subsidies and protection, and I was talking about this at the break a little bit, but I'll revisit this quickly. Um, subsidies, the U.S. will subsidize certain types of crops uh, or farms that grow certain things will actually give them money which allows them to sell those products at a lesser cost than what it costs them to produce it, uh, which gives them a huge competitive advantage in selling those things. Uh, protection policies, like in Canada, supply management stuff, uh, we see that happen here. We don't subsidize like the United States. Okay. Uh, we also see state land grabs. 
Well, state land grabs basically are, as you see, countries go, who don't have a lot of cultivated land, they can cultivate, going to other places and actually purchasing uh, land. I mean, example, Saudi Arabia purchased 500,000 hectares of land in, 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 in uh, Tanzania, Tanzania, uh, we see South Korea acquired about 700,000 hectares in Sudan. You see them go to these part of places and actually acquire these things. Um, some places will actually have restrictions in terms of what can be sold. Places like Japan, for example, uh, they actually have laws uh, which uh, restrict where they get their agro from in terms of what, how much foreign food can actually be sold in their stores that are not locally sourced. Yeah, there's actually restrictions on that kind of stuff as well. And that does stuff obviously to, to uh, supply and demand in terms of the equally the buyers that they buy. Uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, right, which was between you know, basically everybody that was on the Pacific Ocean, uh, actually there was a huge hiccup from the United States uh, against Canada because we did uh, supply management and it created this, uh, the, it was sort of one of the hiccups with China in terms of getting these agreements signed was the fact that um, the agricultural sector had a, had a competitive advantage um, and so they wanted to throw us out of it. Um, part of this argument. There's a little clip that I, I used to show. I don't want to see the live anymore. Um, obviously, uh, the rural state is extremely important. You're looking at uh, agricultural subsidies. A big reason why you see subsidies happen in the, U in the U.S. is because one of one of the aspects of, of, of national security is this food. And you need to feed your people, um, and so um, obviously uh, you want to. You know, there's incentive to create, some, you know, to create sort of programs which fosters these things to actually happen, and people to continuously grow um, locally. If you're buying a lot of your food from other countries, so there's a lot of uh, cross-border kind of stuff happening from a food production perspective. Um, that could be somewhat. If you're dependent on other people for food, that could be somewhat complicated, scary, problematic. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's this incentive that they want to provide for local farmers to grow because they want to be self-sufficient from that respect. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, the farms that actually get the best and most amount of benefits are the, are, are the large ones in terms of subsidies. It's actually meant for small farms, but it just never played out that way. As I mentioned, TNCs can work at, or you know, can be vertically integrated and will have asset access to all parts or can't have access to all parts of the uh, so you know you have a company that can own the seeds, they own you know the, where it's grown, the processing and ultimately the retailing of those published products. Um, we're gonna stop there. Here you're looking at just some of these companies in terms of their scale. Okay. I'll we'll stop here and watch this video real quick. Cafe Society in London, or Berlin, Paris, New York, Toronto, Tokyo. The spread of the big coffee chains has become one of globalization's most powerful icons, luring customers with an exotic range of cappuccinos, espressos, mochas, and blends of coffee from far-flung climes. Coffee is one of the most traded commodities in the world a major cash crop for many poor developing countries trying to trade their way out of poverty. Coffee promises to increase developing countries' share of income from agriculture on world markets, in line with Millennium Development Goal Number 8's commitment to a global partnership for development. But the international coffee industry is in crisis, and many coffee-producing countries are facing disaster. This live program explores the reasons why and some of the possible solutions. According to the International Coffee Organization, there are almost 7 billion kilograms of coffee produced every year in countries like Brazil, Jamaica, Kenya, Uganda, Guatemala, Honduras, Nepal, Mexico, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. Coffee is considered to be the second largest traded commodity in the world after oil. Indeed, uh, we estimate that uh, more than $85 billion are involved in the annual trade of coffee. But the price coffee drinkers pay for their cappuccinos and lattes 
there's little relation to the prices paid to the farmers who actually grow the beans. Over the last six years, coffee-producing countries have seen their earnings from the coffee market fall by a fifth, from seven and a half to around six billion dollars. Today's coffee farmers, there are an estimated 25 million of them, receive less than 1% of the price of a cup of coffee sold in a coffee bar. Think about that. People, how much coffee costs? Why don't you get more? You didn't know. We are very worried about the crisis. If this goes on, we will lose everything. In the past, all children went to school, but nowadays, half of them have to stay at home because we cannot pay anymore. There is no work anywhere because of the situation with coffee, which isn't worth anything, and the harvest has dropped off. This coffee problem has been a big problem for both me and my children. It's caused us a great deal of instability. The crisis has already halved the number of people working full-time in coffee farming in Central America. In the current buyer's market, the price coffee farmers in many countries are getting for their coffee doesn't cover their production costs. Coffee farmers who grow the coffee, who pick it and sell it on, gain just four cents out of every dollar of coffee that is sold on the supermarket shelves. Meanwhile, the supermarkets and the four giant roasters of coffee gain the great lion's share of the, of the dollar, the price that's sold on those, on those supermarket shelves. At the heart of the crisis in the coffee industry today is overproduction. From 1975 until 1989, coffee prices remained relatively stable. So did the supply and demand for coffee beans, monitored by the International Coffee Agreement, which helped guarantee coffee farmers their livelihood. But in 1989, the International Coffee Agreement broke down, ending the 27-year deal between coffee-producing countries, which had regulated the supply and quality of coffee beans coming onto the world market. Since then, it's been a free-for-all, with new, low-cost producers entering the market, leading to overproduction, a wider variety of poorer quality coffees competing for sales, a 50% reduction in the international price for coffee, and, on top of all this, an apparent downturn in the amount of coffee being drunk in the US and parts of Europe. There have been winners as well as losers. Vietnam, for example, sees the opportunities opened up by deregulation to become a major player in the global coffee market. In the late 1980s, Vietnam produced just 1.5 million bags of coffee a year, statistically a tiny amount. But helped by government subsidies, mainly to small farmers with low production costs, Vietnam increased its coffee production 10 times over. It now produces, in an overproduced market, up to 15 million bags per annum. In 10 years, it's become the second biggest coffee producing country in the world. But has this rapid expansion affected the quality of the product? Uh, in Vietnam, you can find very good quality coffee, but unfortunately, because they grew so fast, they did in 10 years what the country like Colombia did in 100 years. So they are very good at developing their agriculture, but when the processing of coffee takes place, there are many mistakes, many difficulties. The quality is not as good as, a, as another origin that had a tradition and a technology in producing good quality coffee, the market will pay less for that low quality coffee. But Vietnam is not the only country responsible for the overproduction in the coffee market. Brazil, with 300,000 farmers and 3 million people directly employed in the coffee industry, remains the world's biggest coffee producer. Here, mechanized harvesting is increasingly used on large-scale coffee plantations. But modernization and questions about the quality of the beans have hurt farmers in the more traditional coffee-producing countries. Ethiopia is renowned as the cradle of coffee cultivation. Here in the Kaffa region, coffee is grown in the rainforest in the same way as it has been for centuries. No big plantations, and environmentally friendly production. But producing coffee this way in today's market is expensive. 
There is a lot of copy in the world nowadays, so we have to make our copy the best product. You must only pick the red berries. Only the red ones? Yes. Where is your basket? I will show you. Only the red ones that are ripe, not the dry one, not the green or overripe ones. Only the red ones. They are good. Coffee is grown in Ethiopia under the shade of a big uh, indigenous trees in all places. If there are places in, the, in this country where uh, coffee is grown by itself under a big uh, trees in the forest, because the coffee beans fall, fall, fall to the ground and they grow by themselves again and uh, without any human interruption. It's grown without the application of any uh, chemicals, chemical fertilizer or chemical herbicide or uh, any insecticide is not used for the Ethiopian coffee. Today, coffee accounts for over 50% of Ethiopia's export revenues. 700,000 households are dependent on it. Despite worldwide overproduction and competition from cheaply produced beans, Ethiopian producers are concentrating on quality. They reason that their coffee's reputation and traditions will still sell in today's difficult markets. Final picking for quality is taking place in the store. That's what they are going to do oh, maybe every afternoon when they take the coffee to, to, to the warehouse. But what I tell them is to, to look into the coffee here probably so that it might be easier uh, in the afternoon to check for quality. So they should take out the bad ones? Yes. The bad ones like this one. For example, this, uh, these coffees are very, uh, very, very small and also they might be, they are black. So all these kinds of coffees are not easy. So they have to be taken out of uh, this coffee. This is the quality control which we are making at the farm level. All these coffees are now the best ones. These are the best ones now. Because there is no local uh, coffee in this one. Uh, all are of good quality. That's why I'm uh, proud of uh, the quality of uh, Ethiopian coffee. Samaria and Dake. Samaria and Say. Uda and but the combination of Tedessa's hand-picking and labor-intensive production methods means a higher price, a price the buyers are not necessarily willing to pay. Buyers are very powerful. They are not paying a good price for the farmers. They are paying a price which is very lower than that of the cost of production. So. We cannot say that buyers are buying at a good price from the farmers or from the suppliers because uh, because of the oversupply of coffee in the world market and the countries like Vietnam which are producing a very cheap and a lot of coffees they are getting coffee from there because of this uh, it's a biased market today not a uh, exporter's market or not a producer's market uh the rapid expansion of cafes in the developed world obscures another factor in the coffee crisis. While coffee consumption worldwide is going up, it's not keeping pace with the steep rise in worldwide production. And in some parts of the world, Germany, France, throughout the European Union and the USA, consumption is actually falling. Some experts worry that poorer quality coffees will mean even less coffee drinkers. What we are trying to say is to the producer firm Try not to put into the market superstandard coffee. Try not to produce superstandard coffee. And you also say that the roses don't buy it? And that we cannot say. Coffee also has other competitors, like soft drinks, which could pose a threat. In the long run, there could be a problem because there is a competition with other liquids out there. And it's their responsibility and their games 
to see what do we offer to the consumer. And I give you this very clear statement in the sense that those countries in the traditional markets in which there has been an increase of some low quality coffees, we see a decrease in consumption. Consumption per capita in countries like Germany. There are roasters and roasters. There are some that only use the best qualities. There are others that mix a little bit more. I cannot qualify what the business attitude of the roaster is. Uh, but they know that if they do not maintain a minimal level of, of, of quality, sooner or later, the consumer is going to desert them. It's a matter of how the consumer is approached, how the blends are, are made, and the technology that intervenes in the processing of coffee in consuming countries is a more and more sophisticated. Now there are procedures to take bad quality coffee with a lot of defects, do evaporization, and, and take out uh, bad taste or bad uh, smells. I think that there is a lack of transparency for the consumer about what he is drinking. Seventy percent of the world's coffee is produced on farms of less than 10 hectares. For these small farmers, the boom in cafes and coffee shops in the developed world in recent years has not brought huge benefits. Because the amount of coffee they're selling is actually quite small. If you see companies like Starbucks, like Costa, like many companies that develop around the world, they are expanding, they are offering, and they are attracting a way of life. Coffee is just part of it. Uh, if you look closely the proportions, you will see that coffee is not the higher proportion in what is being sold. Uh, but it's new approach, is new consumers, but it's a very small segment of the market. Coffee producing countries have seen the value of the coffee they export fall by 20% in the last decade, from 10 billion US dollars in 1990 to 6 billion in 2000. But they could sell to their own populations. I give you the example of Brazil that in eight years went from 8 million bags to 14 million bags of consumption. It's a big population, the incomes of the country have increased. We have that, we think that countries like Colombia, like Mexico, like India, like Indonesia, with the population and the incomes they have, they could repeat that example. Yet another option for small coffee producing farmers is to diversify and move into other crops, but crops which have a value and a market. Growing coca for the cocaine trade has been an option for farmers in Central America. Other crops are more difficult. Prices drop and people find that they go out of business and they can't make money in it, so they get out. That is the nature of the market. You have at the moment an oversupply of coffee. There is no doubt that people will leave coffee production. Uh, they will either uh, leave the land completely and go into cities and towns looking for jobs, or they will switch to other methods, other production. But as the Ethiopian farmers who face this dilemma understand only too well, it's hard to invest in new crops without any money. The world does not take an interest in our copy. We may just as well plow the land and grow something else. But we don't even have money for oxen. Coffee farmers would love to diversify out of coffee, but they find themselves imprisoned by walls set up by rich countries. If they want to move into um, maize, they find their markets are dumped. If they want to move into um, if they want to move into peanuts, they find they can't export because there's huge uh, barriers to exporting uh, peanuts, for instance, to the United States. So although they're, they sh they're desperate to move out and everything is screaming at them to move out of coffee, they actually find themselves in prison, unable to shift out of coffee. Fair trade offers another way out of the coffee crisis. Currently, fair trade accounts for just 1% of the global coffee market, although it is growing. Sales of fair trade brands increased by 22% between 2001 and 2002. Fair trade enables consumers to make a choice over how their coffee is produced. 
That's right. Plays a vital role in so many uh, coffee farmers' lives. It's increased massively because there's a strong consumer demand for a, a coffee that has been produced and bought at a decent price that's been paid back to that farmer. Equally, the money that's paid back to the cooperatives is invested in the, in, in the communities, such as in, in the schools, in the health clinics, but also in the marketing of that coffee for the future. It provides a vital source of revenue for many, many poor uh, coffee farmers. The fair trade principle of guaranteeing price is important to farmers who suffer when coffee prices fluctuate or drop. If a company could give us a single price, that of the fair market, that would be good. In the current market, it wouldn't be worthwhile harvesting the coffee because we won't be able to pay the workers. Fair trade is well intentioned, but my own personal belief is that what the farmers overseas are looking for in the countries in which we deal, which is after all five sixths of the world, uh, what they're looking for is non intervention. They're looking for a fair chance to compete. And there is a lot less rules if you have uh, the opportunity to compete and the markets do the job for you. And I think my impression is uh, that farmers, even in distant areas, even illiterate farmers, have given me lectures on pricing in the Chicago markets. Uh, they know this today. Uh, technology has revolutionized uh, the world of agriculture, and these are not stupid people. Uh, and I've yet to meet a stupid farmer. Fair trade coffee also acts as a quality guarantee. Producers sell direct to importers like Simon Wakefield. Simon has spent much of his working life around coffee beans, working with the farmers who produce them and making decisions about quality. For him, it's an all-consuming passion. We're looking for um, a good full-bodied flavour, which is strong, you can taste it right in the back of your palate. You get a little bit of acidity or wininess out of it, a, a wine, a, like a fruity wininess, like a, a, like a wine, if you guess, uh, that, that sort of grape fruity. Um, and you'll get very good flavour out of it, and nice floral, floral notes to it. Should coffee be treated like wine? Coffee should, yes. Yes, it should. Um, it hasn't been, but it's, uh, the, the, the knowledge and the interest, I guess, of the consumers is, is getting to the stage now where people are interested in it and they want to know where it comes from. Every country tastes different and every region of coffee within that country tastes different as well. Does coffee deserve to be priced like wine? Yes, I mean, it, it does, and I think in the, in the retail sector it is priced like wine. Um, there's, there's quite a heavy, quite a healthy price to pay for a, a cup of coffee or a, a pound of coffee in the shops. But the farmers um, don't see much of that. The farmers don't see much of that, correct. Coffee importers like Simon have been makes a difference. Tedessa is hoping his emphasis on traditional quality control techniques will help find new markets. Finally, we have to be tested by women which are employed in this factory. And then they keep the uh, bad beans which are insect beaten, maybe which are rotten or, or uh, which are uh, broken beans will be picked by the woman and the uh, finally one thing guys you just heard that last part here you're talking about gender differences in terms of the type of labor that was in the um we did that i will see you guys on monday i hope you enjoy the rest of your week if you have any questions for your test i mentioned one of the hours uh, i understand the submissions are in
Thank <laughs> you.